So today we're taking a look at Simon Sinek. He's basically the master corporate guru. And before I get started with this video, uh, I must say he's an absolutely great speaker. Fantastic. You listen to him speak. He smiles. He captures your mind. He says something funny. He breaks complicated ideas down into four or five simple steps, draws little diagrams. And when you're watching him, it's really hard not to like the guy. Having said that, if you take a second and listen to the things that he actually says, it's like, wait, wait, what? <laughs> For example, like this clip where he's talking about how executives are like your parents. Brothers and sisters. Now, how do you create brothers and sisters out of strangers? Common beliefs, common values, you know? Parents, in other words, executives who care about their children's success. Okay, so see, this is what I this is what I mean. Like, it sounds really nice. There's the nice motivational music in the background, but your coworkers are not your brothers and sisters, and your executives are sure as heck not your parents. Not even in a, a little sense, right? Like Simon Sinek is the opposite of me. Simon will tell you that if you hate your job, it's because you need more trust and more bonding and more empathy and that something is wrong with your outlook on life. He'll tell you to really appreciate the little things and you know, Simon is hired by CEOs to come in and motivate workers to work harder while telling them what they're doing is good, but also telling them it's just because you have bad leadership. That's why you don't like your job. We need good leaders and your bosses, they need to change. And then everyone feels good at the end of the day and at the end of the speech and all the workers go and make the company a bunch more money and he validates all of the workers without ever addressing the actual elephant in the room. Then there's me <laughs> and I'll tell you that this is all nonsense and no amount of team building, family atmosphere, being invested diminishes the fact that a job is an exchange of value for money for profit. That's it. Anything else is psychological manipulation. That's the difference between me and Simon Sinek. Now you see, Simon Sinek comes from a background of advertising. He worked in New York for the ad agencies of Euro RSCG and Ogively and Mather? I don't know. He made a TED talk that went viral. It's got like 14 million views on YouTube. And pretty much from there, he realized he could become a guru. And so that's what he did. He started taking basic ideas overcomplicating them and then breaking them back down into simple little steps and then acting like he was the first one to come up with this unique idea. I mean, just look, look at his books. He has a book called Leaders Eat Last or something like that, which sounds really nice. And it talks about how good leaders, you know, they're always supporting their, the people below them and all that stuff. But in real life, the leaders don't eat last. In real life, you're fired. Sucks to suck. I'm gonna get mine first because I'm the leader. That's how it works in the corporate world. But Simon here will tell you that's not how it should be and we gotta have good, but that's not how it is. See, I don't see the world for what I want it to be. I see the world for what it is. And so that's the difference between me and Simon. Simon would, would be what you call this, uh, this very well-selling optimistic person, right? You have the optimists and the pessimists, and a lot of people would call me the pessimist, but there's more to it than that. There's also the realist and then the opportunist. And I would say I'm a mix between the realist and the opportunist. You guys are discussing between is the glass half full and is the glass half empty, and I'm just gonna take the glass and drink it and be like, it's water, okay, let's move on. And, uh, but that's not what's, what sells. What sells is the happy, positive, fluffy stuff. I mean, he has a video pandering to middle managers explaining why middle management is the hardest job. Let me show you. Uh, middle management is the hardest job in any organization. Most things break in the middle. So this video has 615,000 views, pandering to middle managers that, I mean, just look at this comment section. You wanna know what middle management actually is? It's people who aren't good enough to do the job, but aren't important enough to make business decisions. Why middle management sucks is because people are hired into management positions that have never done the job before. And they're telling people that actually do the job how to do it. And it doesn't make any sense. And again, this is just 615,000 views on this video talking about why middle management is the hardest job. Like, yeah, I get that there has to be communication from the people at the bottom to the people at the top. Um, but any good lean Six Sigma engineer would tell you that if you can remove steps in the middle 
and make it more streamlined, that's what you would do. I mean, even Elon Musk has said that. For example, I actually don't really like the fact that we lift the cars over and, and, and back. It, Ideally, it, that would be a robot handoff, yeah, roll getting rid of a middle stage. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, okay, let's eliminate the turntable and just have a robot go to robot. Um, and then you don't have like uh, turntable breakers to consider. So is the process necessary? Like, because the best part is no part. Best part of process is no process. So here's a video with 12.7 million views talking about millennials and the workplace and why we're so difficult. And he has boiled it down to four points. It's so ridiculous. The generation that we call the millennials, too many of them grew up um, subject to, not my words, failed parenting strategies. They were told that they were special all the time. They were told that they could have anything they want in life just because they want it. Right? They were told, um, uh, some of them got into um, honors classes, not because they deserved it, but because their parents complained. You can't group an entire generation of people. Like, I wasn't told that I was special. I didn't get into honors classes because my parents complained. I wasn't told that I could have anything I want just because I wanted it. I was told that I had to work for it. If you want it, work for it. I think many of us were. There's this other point here, technology and social media. He says that we're all addicted to our phones and we need validation from people on the internet rather than learning how to have social skills. Another one, he says that we're all impatient because we're used to getting anything we want right now. We don't have to wait. And then he has this other section, environment, where he talks about how, let me just play it, it's so bad. Scenario which leads me to the, the fourth point, which is environment, which is we're taking this amazing group of young, fantastic kids who are just dealt a bad hand. It's no fault of their own. Right, that feels good. It feels good when he's like, oh yeah, it's not me. It's not, it's not me. It's, uh, I was just dealt a bad hand by society and my parents growing up. Like, it, obviously you want to relate to that. And we put them in corporate environments that care more about the numbers than they do about the kids. They care more about the short-term gains than the long-term life of this young human being. We care more about the year than the lifetime, right? And so we are putting them in corporate environments that aren't helping them build their confidence, that aren't helping them learn the yeah. skills of cooperation. Sounds good. That aren't helping them overcome the challenges of a digital world and finding mm -hmm. more balance. Mm -hmm. That isn't helping them. Mm -hmm overcome the need to have instant gratification and Wait, teach what? them the joys and the impact and the fulfillment you get from working hard over on something for a long time that cannot be done in a month or even in a year. Wait, hold on. I, no, I, I get that. I understand the value of hard work over time. I think most of us do, actually. And so we're thrusting to them, them in corporate environments, and the worst part about it is they think it's them. They blame themselves. No, no they, can, I don't. they think it's them who can't deal. And so what? it makes it all worse. It's not. I'm here to tell them it's not them. It's the corporations, it's the corporate environments, it's the total lack of good leadership Wait, hold on. in our world today that is making them feel the way they do. Nope, that's not. See, so it sounded good, right? He's like, I'm, I'm here today to tell you that it's not your fault, millennials. It's the corporations. And most people be like, yeah, Josh, isn't that what you say? Yeah, that is what I say. But then he says, it's the fault of bad leadership. And this is where it all falls apart, Simon. You're not addressing the elephant in the room, but you're appeasing all of us. You're appealing to us. You're trying to validate us and make us feel good. Here's the problem, right? The problem is not bad leadership. The problem is that companies want you to act like you own part of the company. They want you to work like it's your company, but they don't want to pay you like it's your company. They don't want to give you that the benefits like it's your company, right? Uh, you're not allowed to watch the clock because that's bad. Why would you want to be a clock watcher counting every single minute before you can leave? But you can bet your ass that your boss is watching the clock and seeing if you leave every single minute. It, what, what about the fact that you have to leave a, a two weeks notice but your your boss can fire you on a whim? And it's the, it's the hypocritical things like that, the very one-sided nature of corporate that makes us hate corporate. It's not bad leadership. Good leadership doesn't fix those dynamics of power. It, I'm sorry, you can't cover it up like that, Simon. That's just, again, you're making everyone feel good. It's not your fault. It's leadership. They just need to care about you more. No, that's really not what it boils down to, Simon. But that's what I'm telling you isn't what sells, isn't what, what you can put into a book and, and get on the New York Times bestseller. What he says does. Here's a video that has 2 million views where he talks about how 
it's okay to be the idiot in the room. And like the overall sentiment of the video, that's like, it's okay to ask questions and it's okay to not understand something. And it's okay to like verbalize that because maybe you're helping someone else. But this is a, a, a 2 million view video that essentially overcomplicates that sentiment, boils it back down and makes everyone feel good. And that's what people want, I guess. I'm an idiot. <laughs> like, and I'm not being, I'm not being flip about it. Like, yeah. I don't understand very complicated things. And so I ask a lot of questions. I mean, I'll give you a perfect example. So a long time ago, I had a client. So let me pause here for a second and just say, Simon has a very um, predictable process for how he does these videos. He asks a question or poses a question and then tells a story to relate to you and capture you. And maybe he'll make a little joke and then make you laugh. And in the middle of these stories, he's always sure to tell you that it was some big client or it was some generals or some executives at this big company. And, so, and you know, he uses that subtly to elevate his credibility and make himself uh, more of an authority on the matter. And then after he tells the story, he uses science terms to boost his credibility some more. He also speaks confidently about everything that he's saying. You can't question it. He doesn't tell you what to do, so to speak, but he still tells you what to do. For example, his like best-selling book, Start With Why, it's not very commanding. It's kind of like, you know, this is what you should do. And he puts himself to be in this kind of alpha position without being overbearing about it. And again, that's what sells. It's a marketing tactic. And that's what he comes from. He comes from advertising and marketing. So this guy really knows how to grab people. I mean, just look at the, look at these videos. Like, look at this comment, AAVFX. Very true. If you won't ask, you'll never know. Bro, this is the same shit that you learn like day one in school. And the teacher says, hey, raise your hand. There's no stupid questions. Someone else is probably afraid to ask. Just raise your hand and ask. You're probably helping other people. But here's a two minute story about how he does the same thing and it's two million views. He just panders. And I get it, right? He's, he's relatable. He makes you laugh. He smiles. I mean, I, I'd almost want to call him Simon Snake Oil, you know? They brought me on to do some work for them, but, and so all the C-level executives and me. See, right, I, I, I gotta mention, they're all C-level, right? Like the chief, whatever. PowerPoint that they had printed up in front of them, and I had it as, with, as well, and I didn't understand a frickin' word of it, Yeah. right? I was like looking around like, yeah. I'm, you know, and, I, and so I'd raise my hand and say, I'm really, really sorry. Like, like he's such a good speaker. His body language is perfect. He's smiling. He knows how to capture people. And that's exactly what he's doing here. Based on your logic, A plus B equals D. I, can okay. you just say it again, please? I'm really, yeah. I'm really sorry to slow the meeting yeah. down, everybody. You know, and you could see the consultant getting frustrated with me and would try and explain it again. I said, I'm so sorry. And one by one, all the C-level executives said, yeah, I don't understand it either. Now, if the idiot hadn't spoken up, yeah. How the fuck does this have two million views? I don't, I don't get it, dude. Like, I raised my hand because these, uh, these other C-level people were too afraid to, and they didn't want to admit that they didn't understand it. So, like, you know, it's okay. Let me, let me go back to another thing. Uh, uh, millennials in the workplace. And so, I keep meeting these wonderful, fantastic, idealistic, hardworking, smart kids. They've just graduated school. They're in their entry-level job. And I sit down with them and I go, "How's it going?" They go. I think I'm gonna quit. I'm like, why? They're like, I'm not making an impact. I'm like, you've been here eight months. <laughs> you know? Oh, look, look, all these fucking boomers here. Oh, 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 like, bro, I would quit too if I was at a job for eight months and I'm not making an impact. I don't feel like that is something that should be laughed at by all these boomers in the audience or these Gen Xers or, or whatever, right? Like, if you're at a job for close to a year and you're not making a difference, and you want to quit, it's not laughable. That's like a legit reason. If someone doesn't want to feel like a number after eight months, that's not laughable. Like what, what is the show? And so what this young generation needs to learn is patience. We have patience. We just don't have time for your bullshit. You know, like I, I definitely know the value of hard work over time and delayed satisfaction, but I don't have time to get paid minimum wage when I know that you're cashing out Lambos. He just has a way of making everyone feel good about themselves without ever addressing the fact that there are power dynamics in corporate. I mean, there's even an article on Forbes that 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 is author Simon Sinek is full of hot air and other reasons you should follow his lead because he knows how to market, right? Um, deploy scientific lingo. Yep, he does. 
He does do that. Command to control. Position himself as the guy in charge without being too obvious about it. He's careful to speak in an unthreatening tone while at the same time choosing words that establish him as an undisputed alpha thinker. I'm Simon Sinek. I'll, I'll, take you, I'll tell you a little funny story about it. See? Immediately starts the video off with, I'll tell you a little funny story. Every single speech this man does, I'll tell you a little funny story. So, for example, I, I had a meeting at the Pentagon, and I was meeting with some big general. And See? You know when See? You go he uses the credibility. I had a meeting at the Pentagon with some big general. Instantly boosts his authority about whatever he's about to tell you about. This is a weird one. This is a real, real weird one. I'm Simon Sinek, and you're watching Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Leadership is the decision to take care of the person to the left of me and to take care of the person to the right of me. And the best leaders are actually the best followers. Oh, let me stop you right there, Simon. Uh, I don't think that's true. I think that just makes other followers feel good. Right? The followers are like, one of us, he's relatable. Uh, the best leaders are the best leaders. That's is what it comes down to. Leadership is the choice to take care of the people to the left of me and to take care of the people to the right of me to see that they succeed, they advance, that they do well in life. Sometimes at the expense yeah, of Yeah, that sounds real good, right? Like it's, it's their job to make, sh make sure that you're going to succeed. That's not how leadership works in the corporate world, Simon. We all know that. Leadership means that I'm going to tell you what to do and you're going to do it. And if you don't, heh, well, we're going to put you on a pip and then you're probably going to get fired. And if you do do something, if my team does do great work, well, I'm going to get credit for all that great work because I'm the leader. Like, it shouldn't work that way, like you're saying. Yeah, but we all know the reality of how this world actually works is what I'm saying. I get it now. We are all the leaders. We are all leaders and we're all followers. I get it now. We are all the leaders. No, no, you're not behind the brand guy. <laughs> we are not all leaders and all followers. It's just a, it's just validating and making us feel nice and good about ourselves. And I'm just employee number 8B743, but I'm a leader. So the intern to the president, CEO, the intern has to be thinking about the person to his left and the person to her right. And when we all do that, Correct. then we are better together. Wow, he just said that like it's some mind-blowing thought. You should you should treat people good, and when we all do that, we'll work better. No shit, Sherlock. I'm gonna give you guys an example of how Simon speaks and can make anything sound interesting. Okay, so here goes. A peanut butter and jelly is the perfect example of what you can achieve by combining three ingredients to make a wonderful product. Now, for example, if the C-suite is the bread, the managers are the peanut butter, and the employees are the jelly. You'll have a great sandwich as long as your ingredients are top quality. But what we're finding now is that the bread has become stale, and your peanut butter and jelly is no longer as tasty as it once was. What you need to do is pay me a lot of money to convince your workforce that the bread isn't actually stale, but they're just thirstier than normal. <laughs> I mean, like, this is how he speaks. Like, here's one that sounds really heartfelt and good. This is a tweet. Average leaders give people something to work on. Great leaders give people something to work for. I mean, honestly, wouldn't great leaders do both? 2,000 retweets, 9,000 likes, like so, so basic. Comparing ourselves to others might be natural, but it's also deadly. By taking an infinite approach and reframing your competitors as worthy rivals, the success of your peers becomes fuel for your own growth as opposed to the, your source of insecurity. Okay, comparing yourself to others isn't deadly, right? Like if you obsess over what people have compared to what you don't and you make yourself depressed over it, right? Yeah, that's bad. But comparing yourself to others is how you get better. That's just, that's how life is. You just... You want to get better? You look at what other people are doing, how they're doing it, and then you look at what you're doing, and you try to improve. It's not deadly, but when he says it like that, it sounds really nice. How do you win a game that has no end? The more Simon started to understand the difference between finite and infinite games, the more he began to see infinite games all around us. He started to see that many of the struggles that organizations face exist simply because their leaders were playing with the finite mindset in a game that has no end. The leaders who embrace an infinite mindset in stark contrast build stronger, more innovative, more inspiring organizations. They have the resilience to thrive in an ever-changing world while their competitors fall by the wayside. Ultimately, those who adopt an infinite mindset are the ones who lead the rest of us into the future. Look at this mumbo jumbo buzzword jargon here. Here's a video from his Twitter where someone asked him a question, is college a waste of time? I know there's a whole movement against college, and one of the reasons there's a movement against college comes from people who've done extremely well, either while they were in college and dropped out, Mark Zuckerberg, and so they stand up and say, you don't need college, I didn't need college. Well, that's true. 
Some people don't need it, but there's more to college than simply the, the subjects that we learn. Do we need the What? subjects in college? Yes. Not really. Yes you, yes, you do. Most of the stuff we'll study in college, we won't need in future, in our future, and it won't help us be successful. Uh, I mean, but we're learning more true, but... School. We're learning how to interact with other people. Um, for many of us, it's the first time we, we left home. Okay. We're learning to fend for ourselves, do our own laundry. So are you telling me that I should go to college and get into thousands and thousands of dollars worth of student debt so I can learn how to do my own laundry and budget my money? What money? I'm a college student. Are you out of your mind, Simon? 51,000 views! Get a job, provide for ourselves, budget our money. That's a new one. Um, for many people, they're living in dorms, they're learning to interact, uh, they're learning independence, they're learning self-reliance. It's also the first time in a classroom where your professors will expect you to disagree. In high What? school, largely- Hold on. No, your, your professor is not going to expect you to disagree with the math that he just wrote on the board. He's, if he writes an equation and you say it, no, that's not true. He's going to be like, excuse me, this is math. <laughs> yes, this is correct. Maybe in a, in a philosophy class where he's like, what do you think about this? Should this be or should this not be? But those are useless degrees anyways. Professors will expect you to disagree. In high school, largely you do as you're told, you take the test and that's it. In college, in college you do as you're told and you take the test and that's it. That's, that's the same shit. It's about discussion and it's about disagreement. No, it's not. There are no right answers. So one of the things you'll learn is how to disagree, how to form an argument. There is so much more that you learn in college that will help you in the rest of your life. So I should, I should, again, get into student debt so I can learn how to disagree. Are you kidding me? Choose your classes based on the quality of your professors, not based on how easy the classes are or sometimes even just what the subject. Okay, you want to know something, Simon? The, the easy classes are the ones where you disagree with your professors, like the philosophy ones. So here's a video where Simon says, if your boss is terrible, don't hate him. Don't dislike him. Have empathy for him. And again, this is what he does with his whole speech. It's not your fault. The leadership is just bad. Feel sorry for them. I'm going to tell you, go get a different job. Fuck that guy. You know, <laughs> bye. I'm out. I'm not going to be like, oh, man, I'm so sorry that you feel that way. I guess I'll just keep working here until you figure it out and can adjust your viewpoint from finite to the infinite. No, <laughs> go get a different job. Bye. Don't tolerate having a trash boss just because they're not an infinite minded player. You're an infinite minded player and your boss is a finite player. Do not hate them. Do not blame them. Yes, blame them. Have empathy for them. M maybe Remember, that. We don't know where they worked before. We don't know what conditions and that they worked in before. We don't know how they were beaten down. Remember that they've made it through the ranks. They've made it to their position yeah. following the finite rules of the game. And so when you tell them you have to change, why would they change? Like what got me here worked just fine. Now, they're ignoring the fact that that's, they're, they're highly stressful. They, they struggle with trust. They may not sleep well. What are you like, talking about, Simon? All of those things that cause personal stress are usually because we're playing by the wrong rules for the game we're in. That's why What are you talking about? Stressed. We're talking about infinite and finite now, but we were talking about a boss that was bad. Like, wh where are you going with this, Simon? The single, the first thing to become a leader is you have to want to be a leader. Like, if you don't want to be one, there's nothing I can do. So, you know, there's a funny, there's a funny joke. How many, how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? One, but the light bulb has to really want to change. <laughs> <laughs> It's not even funny. Um, Here we go. What Here do we you go. do when your employees won't listen? Or how do you make people listen? Asks Chelsea. Ooh, Chelsea. Okay. Um, there's a wonderful little book called How to Talk to Kids So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk. Yes, it's a parenting book. It's also a... Br Jesus Christ. Come on. Like, his first advice to get your employees to listen is to read a book about how to talk to kids. Like, how condescending is that? Are you, for, like, is, is that really your advice? What's going on? Here we go. Why do we That's, chase profit? Why is money and the, accumulation, and the accumulation of it a top priority, asks Alan. Well, partially it's our society. Our society has defined success by your car, your house, your bank account. Well, apparently you define your leadership training as $100,000. That's society, is it? Is it, Simon? It's unfortunate. It's just the way we've gone. It doesn't have to be that way, but it is. We chase profit also because that's how uh, we're judged. We're judged in our companies very often by how much we produce, by how much we bring in. Um, we need to change the incentive structures. Um, we need to judge people by helpful, how helpful they are to others. Are they good 
team members. Come the fuck we off. need to find better balances in our society. And this is all nice. We need to learn to be Sounds a little more good. Zen Buddhist and learn to disconnect ourselves from the material and find joy and happiness in our friends and the things that we do, in the experiences that we have, not just oh the my stuff God. that we have. So I think it just takes practice and uh, and a little change in our society. You see how he just like swerves these really difficult questions. You hate your job, you just need to be a little bit more Zen Buddhist and it's society's fault. Which then begs the question, how do we change our society? Change starts at home. Okay, pens what you want to do. Dude, I just don't get how this guy's such a guru. Like, he comes from advertising, he did a TED Talk, and now everyone, he's like Tony Robbins. He's just like, tells everyone what they want to hear without actually <laughs> telling them what, what it is, you know? Maybe I should start doing that. I, just just type in, like, look on YouTube. Look at, look at all these Simon Sinek motivational videos. This shit is nuts. I'm gonna start. I'm gonna, I, this channel is becoming a motivational channel. If that's what I'm doing. If that's what gets views and can pay off my house, I'm doing it. Anyways, guys, if you enjoyed this, do me a solid. Click thumbs up, click like, click subscribe, and leave a comment. Let me know what you think. See you in the next one.